I have a joke about chemistry, but I don't think it will get a reaction. Today, I'm going to recap a 1995 crime thriller film called Seven. A quick warning, there will be major spoilers ahead. In an unidentified city of constant rain and urban decay, Detective William Somerset is preparing to retire and leave the horrors of the city. Before he retires, he is partnered with Detective David Mills, a cocky, young and short-tempered cop from Springfield, a comparatively small town. He and Somerset meet at the scene of a homicide Somerset is investigating. Somerset offers to take Mills out for a drink so they can talk and get to know each other, but Mills is too eager to get right to work and is unimpressed with Somerset's attempt to mentor him. The two investigate the murder of a morbidly obese man who was fed spaghetti until a kick to his stomach burst him open. Somerset investigates the murder, while Mills is given the murder case of prominent defense attorney Eli Good, with greed written in Good's blood on the floor. Good was forced to carve a pound of flesh off of his body, and subsequently bled to death. The police captain gives Somerset an evidence container with three slivers of a plastic-like material, found in the stomach of the obese man, which he was forced to consume along with the spaghetti. Going to the victim's house, Somerset find three groove marks in front of the refrigerator and finds that the plastic-like sliver fit into them perfectly. Knowing the slivers resulted from the refrigerator being moved, Somerset looks behind it. He finds the word gluttony written behind the fridge in Greece, along with a note containing a quote from Milton's Paradise Lost. Somerset theorizes that a serial killer is basing his crimes on the seven deadly sins, with five more to go. To give Mills and Somerset a chance to get along with each other, Mills' wife Tracy Mills invites Somerset over for dinner. While they are eating, an elevated train passes by on the track nearby, making the building and all its contents and inhabitants tremble. The couple mention that that's why the realtor was so nervous for them to see the apartment quickly, trying to hide the proximity of the train. After Tracy goes to bed, Mills and Somerset examine case evidence from the two scenes. They find a picture of Good's wife, with blood painted around the eyes. Believing that this means she is supposed to spot something about the murder scene that nobody else would, the detectives have a distraught Mrs. Good look at the pictures in a safe house, and she notices an abstract painting that is upside down. Brushing powder on the wall behind the painting, Somerset finds fingerprints outlining the words help me. After running the fingerprints through a fees, the prints are traced a day later to a pedophile named Victor, who escaped conviction for the rape of a minor due to the efforts of his lawyer, Eli Good, the greed victim. SWAT and the detectives raid his apartment and find Victor to be the sloth victim, having been bound to his bed for one year to the day, as evidenced by pictures at the scene, one taken every day from the day he is discovered. Remarkably, he is still alive but suffering from severe physical and mental deterioration. His hand was cut off and pushed onto the wall behind the painting to leave the prints. Mills and Somerset asked to interrogate Victor in the hospital, but the doctor says that he's chewed off his tongue and that his brain is mush from the ordeal. That evening, Tracy calls Somerset and requests that he meet with her. The next morning, Somerset meets Tracy in a diner where she tells him how miserable she is in the city. At Somerset's urging, Tracy reveals the truth of her request to meet. She is pregnant, afraid of raising a child where they now live and afraid of telling David. Somerset advises her to tell her husband only if she decides to have it, and he sets himself as an example. He insisted his partner have an abortion, that he finally convinced her, and now he is remorseful. Later that day, using a contact in the FBI, Somerset gets a library list of people who have borrowed books related to the seven deadly sins. The list leads the detectives to a man named John Doe, whose apartment they visit soon after. Doe, his face hidden, sees them as he comes home, pulls out a gun and begins shooting. After a short chase, Doe hits Mills with a tire iron, keeps him subdued at gunpoint, but lets him live and suddenly flees. Mills wants to force their way into Doe's apartment, believing that they have probable cause because Doe shot at them. Somerset tries to talk him down, saying the method they used to find Doe's apartment was illegal and that Doe would go free if they caught him. Mills kicks the door in anyway. While they search the apartment, after bribing a resident to claim she had called the detectives about Doe, they find notebooks of his thoughts, trophies of the crimes, and a picture of Mills fighting off Doe, who at the time was posing as a press photographer. John Doe calls the apartment and congratulates the detectives on them finding him and apologizes for hitting Mills, also telling the young detective that he admires him greatly. Their actions, he says, have caused him to change his plans, and he hangs up. They also find a photo of a young woman, 
a prostitute, who they believe may be the next victim. A receipt leads them to a S&M leather shop, where to place an order for a sexual device. The girl is soon found dead in a room with lust written on the door. Also found in the room is a visibly shaken man, forced by Doe at gunpoint to wear and use the device, a large strap-on dildo with a blade attachment, to rape and kill the girl. The owner of the place, Wild Billy, can give no clue to the physical aspect or the briefcase John Doe used, as every customer used to carry special clothes or equipment into the place. The next morning, a model is found dead with pride written on the crime scene. Her nose has been cut off, despite her face, upon which Doe gave her the choice of suicide by sleeping pills or calling for help in living scarred. She chose the former and swallowed the pills. As the detectives return to the police headquarters, John Doe walks up to them, his hands bleeding. He shaved the skin from his fingertips to avoid identification and gives himself up. He talks to his lawyer and agrees that if he can take Somerset and Mills to two more bodies, he will confess to all the murders. Doe's lawyer also warns that if Somerset and Mills don't agree, Doe will plead insanity, and the last two victims may never be found. Wanting a confession, the detectives agree. Somerset and Mills both have microphones taped to their chest so the rest of the task force can monitor their conversation with Doe. During the prep, Mills tries to tell Somerset about a concern he has with Tracy, but can't bring himself to talk fully about it. As the three travel to the desert outskirts of the city in a car, they are trailed by a police helicopter for security. Doe explains his rationale behind the murders as a way of showing people the truly evil nature of the world, as well as his desire to punish the wicked. He goes on to say he will be remembered and admired for what he has done, having been chosen to do so. As Doe speaks, the disgusted Mills is driven to rage and screams at Doe while Somerset remains calm but plainly worried. Once they reach the outskirts, Doe directs them to a specific spot near some power cable towers. The detectives walk Doe out to an open spot. After a few moments, a van appears and Somerset stops it several hundred yards away, leaving Mills behind a covered Doe. The driver claims someone paid him $500 to deliver a box to Mills at this place at exactly 7 o'clock. As Somerset opens the box, he recoils in horror from what he sees inside. As he races back to Mills and desperately yells for him to throw his gun away, Doe states to Mills that he admires Mills's life, to the point of being envious of his wife and the love they share. He goes further, saying he visited Mills' home and that he tried to play husband with Tracy that day, but it didn't work out and he took a souvenir instead, her pretty head. It was Doe's plan that Mills will kill him, as Doe himself was guilty of envy, jealous of Mills's simpler life. He also reveals to Mills that Tracy was pregnant and that she begged to be kept alive for the child's sake. Mills, despite the pleading of Somerset, is so devastated by his wife's death and the knowledge that she was pregnant that he shoots Doe in the head, Doe closing his eyes to receive his punishment. Mills shoots Doe's body five more times. In killing Doe in vengeance, Mills comes to embody the sin of wrath, completing Doe's masterpiece. Somerset can only stand by, helpless to do anything. After a catatonic Mills is taken away, their captain tells Somerset that they'll take care of Mills, knowing the jury will condemn him. Somerset answers, whatever he needs. He also tells his captain that he will be around, implying that he will be staying on the force. As the camera pans out from the desert, the movie ends with Somerset quoting Ernest Hemingway. The world is a fine place and worth fighting for. I agree with the second part. If you enjoyed this video, don't be shy hit the like button, and if you disliked it hit the dislike button twice, just to be sure. You should watch the full movie. Thank you very much for watching.